Reese Palmer is one of the few black artists in country music. She debuted in 2007 with the hit single, Country Girl. The song made Reese the first black woman to chart a country song since Donna Mason in 1987. Her debut album saw two songs, Country Girl and Hold On To Me, chart on Billboard's Hot Country Songs. Reese later released a children's album titled Best Day Ever in 2013, which got positive reviews. Then, in 2015, she released a follow-up record to her self-titled debut called The Back Porch Sessions, which was produced by Grammy Award-winning producers Shannon Sanders and Drew Ramsey, both of whom also produced her first album. In 2019, Reese released the album Revival, which has been described as Reese's most personal work to date. The lead song off of the album, called Seeds, is described as a protest song and was written after the murder of Michael Brown, who was killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. In 2020, Reese's podcast, Color Me Country, where she discusses the history that people of color play in the country music genre and how that fact is too often overlooked, debuted on Apple Music Country. Reese has interviewed some of country's biggest names on Color Me Country, including Mickey Guyton and Darius Rucker. In 2020, Reese established the Color Me Country Artist Fund as a partnership with Apple Music Country host Kelly McCartney Rainey's Day Fund to support the underrepresented voices of people of color in country music. At the 2020 CMA Awards, popular country artist Marin Morris won numerous awards, including that of Female Vocalist of the Year. She dedicated that win by paying tribute to black women in country music, including Reese. There are some names in my mind that I want to give recognition to because I'm just a fan of their music and they are country as it gets, and I just want them all to know how much we love them back. Uh, and just check out their music after this. It's uh, Linda Martell, Yola, Mickey Guyton, Rissy Palmer, uh, Brittany Spencer, Rannon Giddens. There are so many amazing black women that pioneered and continue to pioneer this genre. And I know they're gonna come after me, they've come before me, but you've made this genre so, so beautiful. I hope you know that we see you. Thank you for making me so inspired as a singer in this genre. Early um, this year, mega country superstar Morgan Wallen made headlines when he used the N-word after a night out, causing for major controversy. There was a swift backlash against him, and huge country music artists began to question country music's role in racism. CMT, country music television, is also pulling the plug, tweeting, we do not tolerate or condone words and actions that are in direct opposition to our core values that celebrate diversity, equity, and inclusion. But with his recent and abrupt return to the genre that just condemned and banned him mere months ago, the question arises, when will country music known for its exclusion, be ready to confront its racism problem and be more inclusive of artists of color. Reese has been asked questions like this her entire career and is here today to talk about those questions in depth. Please welcome Reese Palmer to the hot seat. So first I want to thank you for being here in the hot seat today. Oh no, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Before I start, I just want to, I want to tell you this. In 2007, when I was in high school, I actually discovered Taylor Swift. And that was the first time I started listening to country music. I never listened to it before. Well, I remember loving her so much. I said I wanted to go to her concert. And people in my school, I went to a predominantly white school, told me I couldn't go to her concert because I was Black. So that's when I start looking up uh, Black country singers and you came up. Oh, wow. They told you that? Yes. <laughs> oh. I was actually afraid to go to a Taylor Swift concert back when she was only doing country music. So how far things have come. Well, in some instances, yeah. Right. We'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. But, right. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and jump right into it. So growing up, uh, what, who were some of your music influences and when did you realize that you wanted to pursue uh, country music professionally? My musical influences were pretty various and vast. I'm a big Patty Griffin fan. I have been since I was in high school. Um, I love Tina Turner. Like I was born in the 80s. So like when I was little, little, like 
Tina was it. Um, <laughs> Saka Khan, Phoebe Snow, James Taylor, um, Trisha Yearwood, Patsy Cline, Dolly Parton. Mm-hmm. And um, I really, yeah, just, those are just some of the few. Um, I've always been, you know, I've always gravitated towards like singer songwriters, especially. Yeah. And um, there's something really interesting to me and always has been about someone telling their story like in their own words and that sort of thing. So I think that's why I loved country music so much. And um, when I was a kid, we just listened to everything. Like my parents, I was really fortunate in that I had very open-minded parents that had like really, you know, various musical taste. So I was exposed to everything, but I knew I wanted to sing country. It's a funny story actually. So I was like, I was 17. And I was working with um, two black female managers at the time. And their expertise was like hip hop Mm -hmm. and R&B. And so I was, they they heard that I could sing and we finally decided that we were gonna work together. And we started working on a demo and it was a pop demo. And we were just having a hard time. They were having a hard time trying to nail down like branding for me and like, and and who I was and that sort of thing because of the things that I liked like they would ask me well what do you listen to and I was like well I like Faith Hill and I like Mariah Carey and I like all this and they were like what and so um one day we were sitting around and I have I keep notebooks around me all the time and um to write ideas and um they asked what do you what are you writing in that notebook and I told them that I was writing songs and they said, well, sing us one of your songs. And so I sang this song and they were like, that's a country song. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I said, I wrote it for Reba McIntyre. And they're like, you wrote it for Reba? Reese, do you write these kind of songs all the time? And I said, yeah. And they said, Reese, you're a country singer. We've been going about this all wrong. Like, that's what you are. And I was like, I like country a lot, but I honestly, I didn't see any like you, I didn't see anybody like me. So I didn't think that this was a viable thing for a young black woman to want to do. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, really? And so I was very hesitant in the beginning. Cause I was just like, this sounds like, <laughs> this sounds like a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but you know, I, I loved it. And once we started actually like sitting down and getting in Nashville and working on the music, I just was like, I love this so much. Like this is, this is exactly me. This is me. I can only imagine uh, as me as just a listener, having nobody to see you as a singer or songwriter, it must've been even more difficult. I'll say this. Um, I've been very blessed in that for every horrible situation that there was professionally for me, there were 10 really great ones Yeah, just waiting around the corner. So I had some really, you know, out of a lot of real, a lot of jerks, I had some really great champions in Nashville that stood up for me, that worked with me and that made a lot of the successes that I experienced possible. Now, when you were just 19 years old, two of the biggest music producers in the industry, uh, James Jimmy Jam Harris and Terry Lewis, offered you a record deal on their label, but you turned it down because they wanted to shift your sound from country to more of a pop sound. What was it like making that decision to turn down a professional recording deal, not knowing if you'd ever get another opportunity like it again? Um, (laughs) that was crazy. I know everybody in my family was like, what are you doing? Yeah. And everyone that knew us was just like, what are you doing? Um, I mean, they're Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Like everybody knows Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. And if you don't know them by name, you know their music. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of that stuff was a soundtrack to my childhood. And so it's, um, it was, it was, it was hard. It was a hard situation to walk away from. And, um, you know, there have been moments where I look back on that and I'm like, did you make the right decision? But I I ultimately think I did because had I not done that, you know, I wouldn't have embarked on the career that I ended up embarking on. And so I might not be here right now. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, all things play out the way that they're supposed to in the end. But um, no, it was not an easy decision at all. 
In 2007, you released your first country music album um, that was titled Your Name, Reese Paul, which produced two hit singles, Country Girl and Hold On To Me, which both charted on the Billboard Hot Country Songs and Top Country Albums chart. What was it like having hit songs on the country radio, which is a genre that does not uh, too many Black people are seen or heard on? Um, it was huge. It was a, it was a really big deal. And, um, and actually I wish that hold on to me had been given more of a chance because we killed that the record label killed that one in order to put out no air. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, it was, it was huge. Like it was something that I had always dreamed about being on the radio and, and being out among the people that I admired. And there I was at that moment, you know, getting to walk out on the stage. Like I used to watch Bluebird Cafe on TV. There used to be a show called Live at the Bluebird. And I used to watch it when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, I want to play there one day. <laughs> and I ended up playing there. And then, you know, seeing the Grand Ole Opry on TV. And I got to play the Grand Ole Opry. And, you know, driving from city to city doing radio tour, you get to hear your song on the radio. Mm -hmm. it's, it was, it was, it was amazing. Like it was, it was amazing. Now, have you ever had moments where you were performing and you weren't accepted due to what you look like? And if so, how did you handle that? Uh, there's one story in particular that comes to mind. I was playing a show in Florida and I was a part of a package tour. And so it was myself, Sawyer Brown, um, Chris Young, Carolyn Don Johnson, and Phil Stacy. And Phil and I would trade off who would be the opener opener because <laughs> we were both so new. <laughs> and um, so our tour was sold as a package to a festival. And this festival was uh, sponsored by a radio station. And, um, you know, so we were all, it was like big and rich were on this. Like everybody was on this show. And so um, I remember getting ready to go on stage and usually the people that I would see that look like me worked right. at the, like we're working backstage or working the stage or whatever, or the musicians or something like that. And I was about to go on stage and then my radio rep was with me and the security guard would not let me on stage. Oh my gosh. And he was just like, what are you doing? This is, um, this is the main stage. And I was like, yeah, I know I'm about to, they're playing my song. Like they were playing the opening chords, the country girl. And I'm still like trying to argue to get on stage. Mm -hmm. And then I get let on stage and I walk out and there's Confederate flags and all kinds of stuff flying in the, in the crowd. Right. In those instances, I just like at that moment and in any other time that I experienced that, I just remember thinking, I deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. I work just as hard as everybody else mm -hmm. that's here. And y'all are going to get all of this. You're going right. to get this show and I'm going to sing these songs and you're going to like it or you're not going to like it. It doesn't matter because I'm still getting paid. Right. But like that was, <laughs> that was kind of the resolve that I came to. Like, yeah, it was scary. It was not fun. It made you feel, you know, like you don't belong or like you're not as important as other people or you're not as, um, valued as some of the other people, but I just had to remind myself on a regular basis, you deserve to be here. Like you're doing all the same things that all these other artists are doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've been in town just as long, maybe longer than some of these other people. And you've been writing songs and you've been singing and you've been playing for just as long as all these people. And so you deserve to be here just as much as they do. Wow. I think that's super powerful what you said. You deserve to be there. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that a lot of people of color and women as well have to constantly remind themselves of in, in the entertainment industry. 100%. I mean, that's, I mean, that is the very definition of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I have found that I feel all the time. Like even today, even this far into my career, I still have those moments where it's just like, what are you doing? Like what's <laughs> happening? Like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to give this to me? Are you sure you want me to? Yeah. Now, country music is known to be exclusive to anyone who's not white. Why do you think that there are so few people in country music? And how do you think that this problem can be fixed? Because there are people of color that want to be in country music. I've been asked this question 
in various ways for like the last couple of years. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that it's going to come directly from the industry. Mm -hmm. I think that it's going to come from us advocating for us. And that's partially why, not partially, that's why I started the show Color Me Country, my radio show, and why I started the Artist Fund, because I don't know that the industry is ready. I think certain sectors of the industry are ready, but I don't think the industry as a whole is ready. Right. And this isn't just a country music thing. Like this is a music industry issue that we have. Yes. Like there can only be one Beyonce. Why is that? Like, you know what I mean? And not to say that like she can, she is Beyonce, but like record companies feel the need that once there is a successful someone, like for some reason we can't have someone else on that same level that's just as talented, maybe just differently talented. Mm -hmm. And so in country music, you can have 15 blondes or you can have 20 guys in cowboy hats or in baseball caps, but you can only have one Mickey Guyton yeah. or you can only have one Jimmy Allen or you can only have one Darius Rucker. And I don't know, I mean, it's a combination of things. There's a, there's a sexism issue. There's a racism issue. And it's not, people think racism is like, you know, white hood right. cross. And a lot of times it's just uh, preconceived notions about someone or what you think a black audience wants or what you think a white audience wants and not really taking into consideration the talent or the music or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I think that until country music, the industry and the fandom do some really deep introspection and 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 a lot of change as far as like having our people of color in power positions and in decision making positions until that happens i think that the artists themselves are going to have to the artists and the fans are going to be the ones that are going to change the minds and are going to change the way things are done yeah so that's i i advocate for that all day like and, and I try to help as much as I can because yeah, you can't do it without money. You can't do it without support. So let's create those spaces where these artists can be supported and, and, and amplified. Now, 2021 has actually been a very groundbreaking year for Black people in country music um, and other aspects of the entertainment industry. But as far as country music, Kane Brown played at the Grand Ole Opry for the first time ever during an NBC special in February. Mickey Guyton hosted ACMs with Keith Urban and the ACMs also featured four Black artists in major categories for the first time ever, including Mickey Guyton, Jimmy Allen, Kane Brown, and John Legend actually for his duet with Carrie Underwood. Do you believe that this is something that will continue on in the years to come? Or is this something that was more performative? Because a lot of people are saying that the things that happened uh, last year are kind of seeming a little bit more performative. Um, that's a great question. And I think that um, you can't judge something as performative until you see what the follow-up is. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's real premature right now to say whether it's changed or not. Right. Um, I think we have to look at the way things go forward. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not just in front of the camera. Like we have to stop thinking about, it's just about artists. Like it's about who's getting the jobs behind the scenes. Like who's directing the shows, who's producing the shows, who's writing the shows, who's choosing, who's on these boards to choose who gets the awards. And um, yeah, so I'm looking, those are the things that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. Like who's behind the scenes getting to make the decisions? Because if it's still a bunch of white guys, old white men making the decisions, then no, nothing's changed. And this right. is all, we'll see. Yep, yeah, right, right. We'll see it. Like, <laughs> how they get the Oscars. Remember that year Oscars so white? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, and, and here we are. So it's just like, you know, let's just, let's, I, I would, I would rather wait and see. 
So recently, huge um, country music star, Morgan Wallen, and even I knew his name, and I don't listen to country music uh, all the time, but even I knew his name. He was on like Wendy Williams. He was on a lot of entertainment things, but he faced many consequences when a video of him leaked using the N-word. The country music community immediately came for him, which actually shocked a lot of people, considering how big of an artist he was, especially uh, big artists like yourself, Maren Morris, Mickey Guyton, and several others called Morgan Wallen's behavior out of immediately. What work needs to be done uh, for Morgan to be forgiven? And did you feel pressure to speak out against him as one of the few Black artists in country music? Did you feel like people were looking at you to waiting for you to say something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, so I didn't see it the night that it happened. Um, I was off living and uh, I got, I just remember my phone going crazy. Oh my gosh with people like, did you see it? Did you see it? And everybody sent me the article and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, okay. Um, how do I feel about Morgan? All right, so I have said this many times and I'll say it, um, you can forgive someone like that. Forgiveness is on you. Like it's so, it's, 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 it's subjective and it's on the rest of us. Do we wanna forgive him? Do we not wanna forgive him? And like, it's healthy for us to let it go and not like, not, um, I mean, when I say let it go, I mean like the anger and all that stuff. What's not healthy is like this rush to absolve and forget. Yeah. Like everybody wants to forget everything and like move on and let's pretend like this didn't happen. And, and that's ridiculous because it did happen. Right. And the thing that offended me more, I think, than him even saying it was the reaction from some of the fans. Yeah. And the reaction from some of the people in the industry mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. like, well, rappers say it all the time. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's something that Black people say to each other all the time. Right. <laughs> and, um, and just this whole, like, he's a kid and forgive him. And like, this is a full grown man, a full grown man. Um, the only thing that I can judge him for, because I don't know him. I've never met Morgan. I don't know really anything about him outside of his music. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't tell you one way or the other if he's a good person, bad person, whatever. But I can judge by his actions. Right. And he doesn't seem to be a person that learns very easily from mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's not just this inward thing. It's, I mean, he's a, he's admitted that he has a drinking problem, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that he's working on that. But like the NAACP extended an olive branch to him and wanted to work with him. He yep. has not called them back. Yep. Um, and it is only June and he's already back on the radio. He's already back on playlists, the CMA is gonna make him eligible for awards in the fall. And so I, I ask you, what's changed? Mm -hmm. What's different? Right. What's new? So, I mean, he's already performing again. He performed at Kid Rock's restaurant a couple of weeks ago in Nashville. And so, I don't know. I mean, like to me, just judging from the outside, it doesn't look like much has changed, but right. only he knows that and only he can show through his actions. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody is just really very excited to move on, which is yeah. telling, which is very yeah. telling. I agree. I think that, like you said, people are kind of like, okay, well, it happened. We gave him a slap on the wrist. He knew he was going to get a slap on the wrist. Yeah. He knew he was going to get a slap on the wrist and that it was going to be over uh, within a year, six months to a year. And that's exactly what happened. I actually, uh, I do pop culture commentary on my YouTube channel as well. And I made a video about him and what he did. And that was like one of the most controversial videos I ever did. I had to turn the comments yeah. off actually on it because it was getting so out of control. But yeah, a lot of his fans, like you said, uh, they really didn't even see anything wrong with what he said or did because they do it too. Oh girl, like <laughs> my comments at one point I had to mute and like people still are still, and this was back in February. Wow. Um, like it's, um, it's pretty, I mean, he's sold more records than he ever has. I know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we'll see what happens there. Right. Recently, Marin Morris, who is a huge deal in country music, shouted you out 
in her CMA acceptance speech for female vocalist of the year, which I thought was really awesome. She also shouted out other black women in the genre as well and thanked black women who helped to pioneer the country music genre. She unfortunately received some backlash for doing that. How did you feel about her shouting you out and the other black women during her speech? And what do you make of the backlash that she faced because of shouting out black women? Um, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. God, there were so many. <laughs> that was another conversation I had to mute on social media. Um, I was shocked. I had never, I've never met, I had never met Marin. Oh, wow. Um, at that point. Mm-hmm. We've met since then, but um, we had never met before then. And I was just a fan. And um, I was watching the awards actually to do a commentary for a press outlet the next day because Darius was um, hosting Darius Rucker and I just had him on my show. So I was watching and and then at one point I paused it because I was like, well, I'm gonna go take a shower and I'll come back. And when I got out of the shower, 50 messages and I was like, what in the world? (laughs) And so (laughs) everybody's like, oh my God, Reese, did you see the CMA? And I'm like, I'm watching it. What What are you talking about? I hadn't seen it yet. And so then when I finally got to it, I was just like, oh my God. And it has been, it was complete and total pandemonium for about a month after that. Yeah. Um, I think it was really brave of her. I thought it was a big deal. And like, and, and, and full stop, like she didn't have to do it. Right. That's the thing. Like she didn't have to, she could have gotten up there and just talked about her music and that would have been it. And no one would have batted an eye. Like it would have been fine. Right. And I wouldn't have been mad about it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like nobody would have been offended by that because that's common and that's what you do. Right. She de- decided to take that moment and to take the focus off of herself and put it on others, which I thought was really very cool mm-hmm. and is rare. Right. Artists don't do that. Right. <laughs> like, like artists are, are selfish and full of ego and everything. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah, I, it's, she didn't have to do that. And then when I found out the reason why she did it, I thought that that was really dope. Like she, on the show, on my show, she has said that she just wanted to take a moment and just think about all the, like she thought about all the times that her name was said in rooms where she wasn't and how that changed her career, the trajectory of her career in a lot of ways. And she said she knows what it is to be shouted out by someone bigger than you or someone with a bigger platform than you, I should say, Mm -hmm. and how that can like change the way things go for you. And so again, like I, how do you find fault with that? Right. And so, um, I don't think it was performative from her because again, she didn't have to do it. And I think that she, the backlash that she faced was really interesting because it came from a lot of sides. It came from white people. It came from black people. Mm -hmm. It came from, I saw like there was a guy that was mad because she didn't shout out black men and (laughs) was saying that it was about the erasure of black men. Wow. And it was obvious someone who doesn't know anything about country radio because the truth of the matter is, is that even though we all are doing very poorly, as far as radio airplay is concerned and visibility and and country music is concerned, black men have always historically done better than us. Yes. And so, yeah, like, so when you say something like that, it shows me, it tells me that you know nothing Mm -hmm. about what's going on, the numbers in country music. And then I saw like, would she, would she, this is just performing. She just want people to think she's woke. And again, she didn't have to do it. Like there was nobody with a gun to her back telling her to do it. So I don't know, people are interesting. I think we're in a really, I think people are just tired. Mm-hmm. And everybody just is just tired of everything. And so we're, we've become very cynical. I actually did not know who she was until I heard that speech. And it really? made me, and as well as many others that I know, black people, white people, Latino people, Asian people, it made us go and listen to her music and stream it and buy it. So I think that what she did was positive. Yeah. Well, and Marin is someone, she's a good example of someone who has benefited from music that's not just country music. Like you can listen to her music and you can see that she's been very much influenced by the blues, by R&B, by pop. 
and who are the purveyors of that sound but us right. and so i think that is a really cool thing like a full circle like a recognition of you know all these things make me up and so let me try to help these people like i appreciated that now you host the apple podcast color me country where you bring mm -hmm. to the forefront people of color's history with the genre can you tell me about the podcast and how it came about the show is um <laughs> I have a, one of my best friends um, had told me for years that I needed to do a podcast and that I needed to do it about country music and and all these things that I like to talk about. And I was just like, eh, no one's gonna want to listen to that. And then I have two children and I'm a, a husband and all these other things going on and a career. And so I didn't have time to do it. And then at the beginning of quarantine, I found myself with, suddenly no shows and a lot of time yeah. and so I and I knew that other people were at home too and so I just started reaching out to my friends and people that I knew in the business and I was just like let's just talk mm -hmm. because I wanted to dispel this whole idea number one that black people don't like country music mm -hmm. and number two that everything's okay because I think there's a tendency when you are successful in country music or in any white space and you're a person of color that you give off this whole thing that everything's fine. Yeah. Like nothing's happening to me. Everything's good. I'm not a hostage. Like, <laughs> like kind of thing. And so um, I wanted to create a space because I that was how it was for me in the very beginning. Like if you read any of my early interviews, everything's fine. Right. And I go out of my way to make sure to let you know that everything's fine. No one is racist. Everything's fine. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and like lying and basically like just completely lying to myself and to others. And so um, I wanted to create a safe space because a lot of times you're talking to white people when you're doing these interviews. Right. And so you're talking, these artists are able to talk to me because I'm a peer. I'm a person of color, just like them. In a lot of cases, I'm a woman, just like you. Mm -hmm. And so like, give me the real, like let's, cause we can both compare notes and we can be honest. And I'm not a journalist. Like I'm just, I'm just Reese and I'm just curious. And so, yeah, that's where the whole thing came from. I just wanted to dispel these ideas. And I wanted to tell this history that I know that it doesn't seem like a lot of people know. And it just grew legs. And then when the Apple, when Apple came along, it changed from a podcast to a radio show and we were able to play more music and that sort of thing. And then like the, the playlist has a lot of meaning and that sort of thing. So it, it's just, it's become a lot bigger than I, and I, that I ever hoped it would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's, it's become a space that like a safe space, which is exactly what I wanted. So I, I, I love doing it. And um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Now, my last question for you is, is there anything else that you would like to say about anything? Sure. I mean, I'm working on a new project right now. I'm hoping to have something out. Oh, Lord, good Lord willing and the creek don't rise by the end of the year. <laughs> um, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> um, I'm working on a couple more um, shows uh that'll be out soon hopefully um the show color me country radio is still going on we'll start our second season in august i'm very excited about it and um, you can check it out on apple music and if you listen the day that it's live it's free mm -hmm. and um also the check out the color me country artist grant fund we have to date given out i believe about 35 wow. artist grants and we're still going and we can always use the money and none of the money goes to me. It goes directly to artists of color who are pursuing careers in Americana and country music. Wow. And yeah, and it's been really awesome to do. And, and I feel really blessed to, you know, be the one that gets to, to make those emails and like, Hey, I'm sending you some money. Oh my so um, yeah, you can go to colormecountry.com and information about the show, me and the fund are all there. 
And oh. thank you so much for sharing your platform with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for being on here. I'm, I can't believe I got you on here. It's an honor to speak with you. I've been following your career for almost 15 years now. And you I have. have. I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Reese. It's such an enjoy to speak with thank you. you. It was great to talk to you too. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye.